I think when you see the image of Enrique Darrio, right, he appears as this really tough guy. You know, he has these sunglasses, that cap, that military vest. But I think the moment that you face him, you spend a little bit of time with him, you start to understand that you're facing a man that is deeply insecure. You know? And that's sort of my first impression of him. He is someone that never really understood where he belonged. And then suddenly, in the Proud Boys, he doesn't just find this deep sense of belonging and community, but more than anything, he finds power. You know, he tastes power for the first time. He suddenly goes from being this ordinary Cuban guy, you know, this, this, this son of immigrants, this guy that used to sell camera equipment in Miami, to suddenly being praised by Donald Trump, by Roger Stone, by Ted Cruz. Suddenly, white people love him. He goes from being an ordinary guy to suddenly referring to himself as a king, as a soldier, as a general. No, it's a lord of wars. And I think that power, that can radicalize you. No, that power is contagious. The power of belonging, the power of being validated by the powerful people. The power of being people. at the top, suddenly yeah. being at the top to the point that you believe you are invincible. The last time I talked to him was in February 2022. And it was like texting someone that felt absolutely no fear, mm. no remorse. He could have never fathomed that he would be facing 22 years in jail. Why? Because white supremacy makes you believe that you are invincible. There's no accountability there. Talk to me, Ryan, about that 22-year sentence, the harshest punishment in a January 6th case so far. Remind us of his role in the riot. When we say general, not soldier, what did that actually look like? Yeah, well, you know, as you mentioned, he was at that Baltimore hotel for the January 6th attack, so he wasn't, you know, directly directing everyone on the ground that day, but prosecutors say that he was essentially pulling all of the strings and he would have been there on January 6th had he had the opportunity. What's really interesting about this now that we know this other layer, which is that Tario was in communication with a member of the Metropolitan Police Department before a lot of this. That individual has now been charged actually with sort of tipping off him about this idea that he was going to be arrested for this separate incident that took place before January 6th. So he was a, ended up being in jail on January 6th itself, or right up to before January 6th, was ended up arrested. But he knew about that. And the question was, you know, would he had still come to D.C. if he knew he was going to be arrested? And it appears that he did know he was going uh, to be potentially arrested, that there were charges out, there was a warrant out for his arrest that day. So it adds this other complicating factor. What did he think that was going to do uh, to the rest of his sort of team? Um, you know, he he took these efforts to sort of clear his devices before he was actually after he was actually arrested, but that evidently didn't work because prosecutors were obviously allowed to get all, all of this in the end, and the FBI was able to determine it. But certainly, that coordination between law enforcement um, and and this defendant was certainly significant. One thing that I would note that was interesting just in the trial is that you know the defense definitely tried to play up uh, his background and heritage uh, for the during the trial. Mm -hmm. uh, they did not shy away from that um, at all, especially when talking with the DC jury. But then when you had the letters come to the judge. Uh, from his family, they were just talk talking about him as Henry. That's how they referred mm -hmm. to him. It was all Henry this, Henry that, um, really sort of shielding away from any mention of his, his background or heritage at all. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. And, and I wonder, so it's easy to talk about him as though he's a unicorn, but he's not the only person in these groups. No, not at all. I mean, so I'm thinking of Enrique. I'm thinking of the other January 6th Latino insurrectionists that I've interviewed, like Gabriel Garcia. I'm thinking of the Latina moms from Monster Liberty. Gays Against Groomers, I've spent way too much time with, with a lot of these folks, but I think, you know, there's, there's some underlying threads that connect everyone. Yes, this, this quest to approximate yourself to whiteness, sure. This quest to, to, to have power, sure. But then there's this, this paranoia of communism that we can't underestimate, that Enrique talks a lot about, right? This idea, and he, he kept talking about this in 2019 and, and 2020 and 2021 when, when, when we were communicating, this, this idea that communism is infiltrating this country. You know, that one day you will wake up and suddenly wake up in, in, in a place that's overrun by Fidel Castro, right? Let's remember that a couple of days before the insurrection, Enrique starts to sort of create this idea that the capital was being run by the Bolsheviks, knowing by communists. And so that's those same talking points. We can say that they're exaggerated or not. That fuels violence. Now, that makes that paranoia is real for a lot of these folks. And so I think that pattern and that threat and that overwhelming paranoia of communism is very much present in their heads well, all the time. I mean, it